Bibliophiles of the internet, my name is Adriana and today I'm here to bring you my March wrap up. As many of you know, March is Women's History Month, so with only a couple of exceptions, I chose to read exclusively from female authors. I also read a lot more than I thought, so let's just get into this. The first book I finished in March was Little and Lion by Brandy Colbert. This is a YA contemporary story that explores mental illness and is also queer lit. It's about a young black teenager named Suzette who's finally coming home to Los Angeles from her boarding school in New England, which is where her parents sent her after her stepbrother Lionel's diagnosis. Lionel has bipolar disorder and he's just learning to readjust with his therapy and his meds. Suzette is really trying to regain her place in her family and be there to support Lionel, but she's also finding herself attracted to a new girl who just might be the same person her stepbrother likes. Trigger warnings for unadvised medical decisions, depictions of hypomania, ableist epithets, homophobia, and underage substance abuse. I think this story does a great job of addressing the negative misconceptions that most people falsely attribute to mental illness. Specifically when it comes to bipolar disorder, the people who have that diagnosis are thought to be inherently violent, angry, susceptible to drastic mood changes with no middle ground between depression and mania. And along with calling out casual ableism, this book is really about debunking those myths. Another thing I really appreciate is the dynamic between Suzette and Lionel, because here are two messy teenagers who are trying so hard to sort their shit out while also trying to do right by each other, and sadly there are no choices or answers that are entirely good, easy, or right. A running theme in this book is Suzette knowing that something is wrong, but not being strong or decisive enough to do anything about it, and that to me is a paragon of teenage existence. So even though a lot of these characters make some not so great decisions, I appreciate that making those mistakes was part of their process. So overall, I gave this four stars. Then I read Star World by Paula Garner and Audrey Coulthurst, which I talked a little bit about in my recommendations video for hopeful books. This is a dual perspective YA contemporary story about Sam and Zoe who attend the same school but are definitely not friends. One day Sam sends Zoe an accidental text and they start talking and realize that they can really relate to each other because they're both dealing with extremely difficult family situations. Zoe's little brother has fairly severe physical and developmental disabilities and Sam's mom has really been struggling with anxiety and OCD ever since she and Sam's dad divorced. Both Zoe and Sam try so hard to isolate themselves and their loved ones because they don't expect anyone else to understand, but once they let each other in and realize that it's okay to trust, their friendship grows exponentially from that point. It's important to note that this story offers representation for queer characters, adopted characters, and characters with disabilities and mental illnesses, and I personally found it to be handled with thoughtfulness and respect. This story really explores the stigma surrounding disabilities and mental illnesses. Especially from the outside, it can be hard to understand these experiences and to know what to expect, which is exactly why Sam and Zoe have both preemptively closed themselves off. They don't let people in, they don't like to share their problems or their peripheral experiences with these things because they're afraid of being pitied or judged. It really shows why families who are dealing with disabilities or mental illnesses might internalize that negative stigma and emotionally isolate themselves. And what I appreciate is that neither Sam nor Zoe have shitty friends or support systems who would purposefully hurt them or who lack empathy or thoughtfulness. In fact, they're surrounded by a lot of good folks, but because they've never let those people in, it's very hard to start at this point. It's just easier when you make a new friend who offers just as much as you're willing to give. It's easier to let them in at the ground floor and to see what happens. Especially because their routines and experiences very strongly revolve around one of their family members, they already understand each other in that sense. So not only does this story present a beautiful foundational friendship, but it also makes the case that we as a people are inherently hardwired to perpetuate change and to evolve. That is an essential part of us as humans. Sam and Zoe have to learn how to let people in, how to give others the opportunity to know their truths, and how to better act and react so that their family members might thrive and grow, and they do exactly that. I think it's a really wonderful story about safe spaces and learning to help yourself and others while also allowing yourself to be helped in return, which is why I gave it four and a half stars. After that, from my library, I listened to Sadie by Courtney Summers, which is performed by a full cast. This is a gritty YA contemporary thriller of sorts that's partially told through the transcripts of a true crime podcast. It's about a missing girl named Sadie whose younger sister Maddie is brutally killed, and Sadie feels like the police investigation was botched, so she sets off on her own to find Maddie's killer and exact revenge. Major trigger warnings for murder, violence, pedophilia, assault, sexual assault, and drug abuse. And just a note on the representation in this story, Sadie does live below the poverty line, she has a prominent speech impediment, and she is 
is also queer, even though the story is not inherently about her queerness. I think what this story is really trying to drive home is that behind every tragedy is a person with a story and an entire life. This book really touches on how girls go missing and get killed and hurt every single day. It's a ceaseless onslaught that's been normalized just by the pure volume of instances. I think that's why this story is so gripping, because Sadie could be anyone. She's yet another missing girl who's dismissed, whose voice is not actually wanted, and whose truth would never be believed in the first place. That invisibility almost gives Sadie the strength she needs to go out there and take a twisted sense of justice into her own hands. She already knows that she doesn't get a happy ending and that people don't want to hear what she has to say because that would mean shattering the versions of reality that they so desperately cling to. It takes a lot to disrupt willful blindness and ignorance, which is exactly what Sadie's up against, and I think that's why her decisions are so drastic and desperate. I do wish Sadie was more involved in the ending of this story since it does belong to her, but overall I was really captivated by this audiobook and I gave it four stars. Then for the More Manga Please book club, I finally read Go For It Nakamura by Sionde. This is a super funny and sweet queer slice of life one-shot manga about not so openly gay Nakamura who has the biggest crush on his classmate Hiro say despite the fact that he hasn't even introduced himself yet. Nakamura is known for being weirdly intense and awkward, and he is so fixated on orchestrating these perfect moments with Hirose that he often ends up looking foolish. But he does end up bungling his way towards a friendship with Hirose, and it's just really, really endearing and cute. This manga really touched my heart because when I see someone who's so obviously a queer disaster, I relate. Not only does this volume balance humor and heart so well, but I believe Nakamura's confusion and stress because he does not have a model of what queerness looks like in real life. He's taking cues from yaoi manga and anime, these dramatically romanticized and oversaturated depictions of queerness in Japanese culture, and trying to apply that to real life, which is exactly why it will not work. And he's so obsessed with manufacturing these perfect moments with Hirose that he doesn't leave himself enough room to experience and live in those moments. When he finally gets out of his own way and starts spending time with Hirose and connecting with him as an actual friend, that's when their relationship grows. I just feel like this manga hit so many wonderful beats, but it was also comforting and hopeful, and that's exactly why I gave it 5 stars. After that, I listened to Educated by Tara Westover, read by Julia Whalen. This is a nonfiction memoir about Tara Westover's unconventional upbringing and childhood as she was raised by extremely religious survivalist parents. Her father especially was very set on keeping his children isolated from society and keeping his family very self-reliant and entirely off the grid. They didn't believe in modern medicine or going to doctors, they didn't go to schools, and they spent most of their time stockpiling resources for the apocalypse. And yet, with no formal education, Tara Westover got herself into college and eventually attended postgrad programs through Harvard and Cambridge, and this memoir is basically Tara beginning to process all of these experiences. Major trigger warnings for descriptions of extreme physical trauma, abuse, graphic violence, graphic descriptions of injuries and illness, depictions of religious extremism, and invocations of sexist and racist slurs. What really stood out to me is that this memoir is not inspiration porn to show how far Tara Westover has gotten in life despite her family and her beliefs. It really taps into this universal experience of imposter syndrome and the idea that we do not belong and everyone else knows it, that we have to do backflips to justify why we occupy our space. I feel like it's really about the struggle to find yourself and to differentiate the self from what you've been taught. We draw meaning and connections from our personal experiences and from formal academia, but to solely rely on what you've been taught or told is to forfeit the self, because our realities are formed and constructed from the connections we make for ourselves. What's really delicate about this memoir is how the author is able to explore how all of her life experiences have contributed to how her mind and mindset has developed in so many ways. It's just that formal education gave her the vocabulary through which to organize and make sense of those experiences. I was really moved by the scope of this memoir, and I gave it four and a half stars. Then I could no longer hold off reading my arc of Mason Devers, I wish you all the best. This is Own Voices Queer Lit about a teenager named Ben who finally comes out to their parents as non-binary, only to be immediately kicked out. Without any time to even pack or put on their shoes, Ben's only option is to reach out to their previously estranged sister, Hannah, who luckily welcomes Ben to live at her place. So now Ben is transferring to a new high school, considering therapy to process the 
relationship with their parents and just trying to navigate this entirely new space. At their new school, Ben meets an extremely charismatic and charming classmate named Nathan who is making Ben start to believe that maybe safety and happiness are well within reach. Some trigger warnings for parental abuse, misgendering both on accident and on purpose, transphobia, homophobia, brief suicide idealization, and descriptions of anxiety and panic attacks. This is the book of my heart, the book of my dreams, because it's really about acceptance, self-acceptance, safety, and just people as safe spaces. It's about those instances where just being around someone brings a sense of emotional quiet, because you don't have to preface yourself, you don't have to disclaim yourself, because the entirety of who you are is already seen and understood. Something I really appreciate is that this story acknowledges messiness and imperfections. Things don't just magically come together for Ben at any given point. For example, Ben tries therapy for the first time and they don't have any strong feelings about it even after a few sessions, or they could be getting ready for a really meaningful event or looking forward to seeing someone they care about and they'll be having a day where they feel dysphoric or they don't like the way their body looks in their outfit. And reading that, it just really hit me that we're so used to everything coming together, especially in stories of self-discovery and romance, to create these perfect moments when perfect doesn't really exist. Something Integral Ben actually learns is that we have to recognize what is good and what works and what brings us happiness instead of fixating on this idea that perfection is a prerequisite for joy, love, or acceptance. There's a lot. There's a lot this book does extremely well, and I might make another video about it closer to the release date, but this book definitely delivers, and I gave it four and a half stars. Then I picked up A Very Large Expansive Sea by Tahara Mafi. This is an own voices YA contemporary romance set in 2002, right after 9-11, about a young Persian-American teenager named Shirin who has really hardened herself in the wake of all the xenophobic, racist misconceptions about her heritage. She also wears the hijab, which unfortunately makes people target her even more often, and things at her new school are not much different. Until she meets this almost comically all-American boy named Ocean, who's a popular jock and also incredibly charming and and genuine to a fault. And if the two of them want to be together, they have to find ways to overcome their differences. Trigger warnings for bullying as well as xenophobic, Islamophobic, and sexist comments. Y'all know I gotta redirect you to the number one very large expansive C stan, Sajid from Books on My Social Life, whose review of this book is profound and passionate and what really turned me onto this book in the first place, so please, please, please do check that out. Like Sajid, my biggest takeaway from this book was how Tahara Mafi skillfully frames this romantic relationship as a lens through which to confront and challenge patriotism and xenophobia as a response to Muslims' existence. Shirin doesn't really know how to navigate this relationship at first because she thinks her presence inherently takes away from or jeopardizes Ocean's social status, and he just doesn't know anything about her faith, her culture, or her experiences. But Ocean is infectiously charming and honest, and things start to shift when Shirin realizes that he is insatiably curious about who she is, not what she is. It's really about how in this post 9-11 era, Shirin has really internalized so much ugliness and hatred. That trauma and her reaction to that trauma is such a part of who she is, and through the conversation of this relationship, she is learning that sometimes people do deserve a real chance. Not only did I appreciate the way this story subverts misconceptions about what it means to be Muslim, but I was really captivated by the story overall, which is why I gave it four stars. Then my poetry collection for March was Bright Dead Things by Ada Limon. This collection feels very pastoral in a sense, because a lot of these poems are set in the countryside or in nature itself, and Ada Limon's poetry is first and foremost narrative and picturesque. Her poems feel like she's answering a question rather than asking one, and the speaker is always driving towards a definitive endpoint. I think it's kind of the perfect push and pull of feeling small in a world that demands you to be big, and feeling impossibly big when you attune yourself to the smallest moments and details surrounding you in space. This collection explores feminism, Latinx identity, religion, love, loss, and I felt every single moment of it. I gave this collection four and a half stars. After that, I finally listened to Wondersmith, The Calling of Morgan Crow by Jessica Townsend, read by Gemma Whalen. This is a middle grade fantasy series about Morgan who used to believe that she was cursed, but now realizes that she actually possesses an incredibly deep well of magic. In many ways, she's still trying to earn her place in the Wonder Society and learn how to control the suppressed abilities to protect herself and the people she loves. 
I think I enjoyed this book slightly more than the first because I felt like it had a lot to say about how power is the intersection of abilities and intentions. This entire installment is about reclaiming agency and control over your power and your actions because if you have power and you don't use it, you can still harm other folks. You are not innocent just because you do not act or make a choice. Through all of these magical shenanigans, Morgan is really confronting the idea that she has this incredibly unique magic. So how exactly is she going to use it? There continues to be this through line of Morgan believing that she is cursed and dangerous. It still affects her studies and her ability to make meaningful connections with her classmates because she still doesn't believe that she's enough. Teachers and other authority figures are also treating her with wariness and disdain, even going to great lengths to make her feel like she's inherently evil and worthless just because they don't yet understand the full potential of her abilities. That's a hard thing to walk back because if no one believes in you, how can you believe in yourself? I just found this to be a delightful story and I think the next installment is going to go to some really exciting places. I gave this one four stars. As if that wasn't enough, I squeezed in one last book, which was Can't Escape Love by Alyssa Cole, read by Karen Chilton. This is a romance novella that's part of the Reluctant Royal series. It follows one of the supporting characters, Reggie, who is black and disabled and also an incredibly successful businesswoman who owns and runs a very popular geek site called Girls With Glasses. As she tries to elevate her content even more, her insomnia begins to spike, and usually the only thing that can relax her is the voice of this guy named Gustave Nguyen and his puzzle live streams, but his archive of live streams was recently deleted, so Reggie desperately reaches out to him, basically offering to pay him for his voice. Instead, he counter offers that Reggie help him understand this popular fantasy romance anime series that she loves in order to help him design this anime-themed escape room he was hired to construct. And in exchange for professionally consulting on the project, he will talk her to sleep as much as she wants. Now, I've only read two books by Alyssa Cole, both in this series, but I have to say that her romances take off three big boxes that any good romance should have. They are sexy, they are healthy, they are smart. First off, the female leads in this series are just stunning examples of black excellence, and I am so here for it. Reggie, for example, is a black disabled woman who is extremely successful and capable. She is self-sufficient. She knows exactly what she wants. She knows exactly what she is worth, and she will never settle for less. As soon as Gustav suggests that they collaborate on this project, she tells him that he is going to give her the proper credit and acknowledgement and that he is going to respect her work, her time, her perspective, and her input. That, to me, is so badass. I also love that the characters involved in these romances are very open about their feelings and have honest conversational check-ins where they actually voice their needs or concerns. Miscommunication just seems to be such a huge part of the romance genre, especially when it comes to building in tension and conflict. But here we see that we can get that same effect from things left unsaid, conflicting intentions, or differing perspectives. Even though this story is short by nature, these are both complete, complex characters who both get something positive out of this relationship and who want to make it work. I really, really enjoyed this, and as I've said before, I will definitely be reading more from this series. I gave this novella four stars. So at long last, those are all the books I read in March. If you've read any of these yourself, or if you would like to read them now after hearing any of these reviews, I would love to hear from you in the comments. But that's everything I had for this wrap up today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it and I'll catch you on the flip side of the page. Bye.